Hey, welcome to the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest, Alan Bishop. Hey, this channel is all about home distilling and legal distilling. If you've got questions, reach out to us in the comments below, social media, or via bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out thealchemistcabinet.com. Hey, what's up, guys? Had a few minutes here this evening. Thought I'd uh, jump in and do... Another one piece of the time talking head video. Keep questions coming. As always, I'm glad to help you out any way I can. Bishop's Homegrown at gmail.com. Uh, social media, YouTube comments below. Whatever it takes, however you can get a hold of me. If I don't get back to you immediately, it's probably because I didn't see it or because I forgot about it. Or in the rare instance that I lost the video because, like everyone, life. <laughs> so, anyways, let's jump right into it and see what we got here. So, for my buddy Jeff. Hey Alan, thanks for answering one of my uh, another one of my questions. I have another question with regards to starting gravity, and if you've already answered it on another video, I apologize, but I can't find it anywhere. What's the best starting gravity to shoot for regarding the right balance between flavor retention and alcohol production efficiency? I always try to shoot for 1.075 as a starting gravity for both grain and fruit mashes, but I've read some resources that say the starting gravity should be much lower for flavor retention. When I've read other sources that say the starting gravity doesn't matter as long as your yeast is high alcohol tolerant. Just wondering what your thoughts are and thanks for your input. Well, you are on the right track. It really very much so depends on what that base material is and how that material reacts. If you're doing an all grain, for example, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> sinus season going on here, but um, that came out of nowhere. I do apologize for that. Uh, I would normally re-edit and start over, but I don't want to because I'm lazy, so I'm going to just keep moving. Uh, anyways. It, with, for most whiskeys and most bourbons, I usually aim for 1075. That's plenty of alcohol, but still leaves plenty of flavor. It doesn't make real hot liquor. You're not pushing the boundaries of what you need to be doing. That's a good proportion of grain. Usually, you know, what, two and a half pounds per gallon, maybe up to three if you're really pushing hard, depending on what the grain is, if there's rye in there, etc. You start getting much over that nine or 10% alcohol mark and yeah, you're starting to make some hot liquor that doesn't have a real great flavor to it, and you're also starting to stress out a lot of the yeast that you're going to use um, for whiskey production for the most part anyways. Now, I will tell you that yeast is very, very important, and I don't agree that it's all about high alcohol tolerant yeast. I don't, that, that is, listen, I, I, I have a tendency to approach things from, uh, think of it as art versus industry, right? For me, this is art, it's spirituality that lends itself to industry. I can't go the opposite direction. I can't go to industry and then by proxy because it's distillation, it then becomes art. <clears throat> that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So I don't go for those high alcohols. Now, if you're making something like rum or something like that where you got a lot of unfermentable sugar, yeah, you're going to end up at some crazy high, you know, uh, specific gravity values. Now, when it comes to brandy, I personally think 1075 is pretty high for brandy. Uh, you know, if you were to actually take all the fruit itself and press that fruit and get the juice out of it or do a fruit mash brandy, you know, you're not going to end up with more than 5 or 6% alcohol on the high end most of the time. If you're capitalizing, I wouldn't capitalize it up above 9, 10% alcohol on the very high end. Brandies are delicate anyways, right? They're really more about the aroma. You don't want that capitalized sort of uh, sugar bowl thing coming across and taking over the brandy to where you can't really pick up the character uh, that was already there inherent from the fruit, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with capitalizing a little bit uh, in order to get a little bit more yield out of brandy because, to be quite honest with you, especially on a craft distilling level or a large industrial distilling level, if you don't capitalize brandy, Unless you just have a huge bank account and you're very passionate about brandy and it's a secondary or tertiary product for you, it doesn't make sense to not capitalize it from a yield sort of perspective. You just don't want to go crazy with it, right? You want the best of both worlds. You want flavor and aroma and you want some yield. You want enough yield to make it worth your time and effort to process the various different uh, raw materials that you're starting with, but you also want to hold on to what makes them special and what makes them unique and capture their quintessence. The goal here is not to capture the quintessence of alcohol. The goal here is not to capture the quintessence of refined white sugar in a fruit brandy, right? Um, so that's that's the way I would look at it. And I know there's some distillers out there that will say that I'm splitting hairs and let them think what they want. They do what they do, and I do what I do, and you asked me, so I told you what I thought. But uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I Now, the other thing I should have mentioned, rye whiskey. 
So I rarely push over 1055, 1060 on rye whiskey. And the reason for that is because it gets thick and unmanageable regardless of what enzymes that you want to use. Um, you know, it has a lower points value than almost every other grain does. And I seem to get a better flavor when I stay within that range in general as well. I don't have to worry about anything scorching, anything sticking. I don't have to worry about pumping out, all that sort of stuff. I have occasionally made some rye whiskeys that have been 1075. They've been 100% rye. It's a nightmare. I don't like doing it. I will never do it again because I don't have to now at Old Homestead, thankfully. So um, just bear that in mind. And traditionally, bourbons were typically in that 1075 range. Uh, ryes were typically in that 1045 to 1055 range if they're pot still. Now, column still is a little bit different, but we're not. I'm not dealing with column here. I'm talking to you about pot still stuff. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to that. Uh, but bear in mind as well, most of those didn't finish out. They'd finish out at 1010, 1015, something like that, have a lot of residual uh, starch and therefore aromatic compounds to them. So even if they were aiming for a 9, 10% alcohol for distillation, uh, there was always some unconverted stuff in there in order to raise that quality. Now, if they could have converted it, they probably would. They just likely didn't have the enzymatic power to do what they needed to do uh, until much later on in the development of distilled spirits in the United States, you know, post-1870, 1880, somewhere around there. And even at the Prohibition, I know that there were distillers that were purposely staying inefficient because they understood the quality thing. And here's where a lot of the confusion comes from. So as you guys know, I research the history of distillation a lot. Not only in my region of the Black Forest of Southern Indiana and wider throughout Indiana, but throughout the entire world. I read a lot of pre-prohibition literature. I read a lot of post-prohibition literature. I think the confusion, truthfully, in the United States when it comes to the quality of spirits and what you should be aiming for is legitimately because of prohibition. An entire generation of distillers died out and then the monopolies moved in and they took over everything and they industrialized it and they based it on the Seagram's methods and that whole thing. And it just wiped out the old folk, the folk distilling traditions that made higher quality spirits. Um, you know, and there's no, I will always say this, there is nothing wrong with good Kentucky bourbon made on a column still, nothing at all. But it's not the same as what it was prior to the introduction of the column still. It's not the same as what it can be on a pot still. There are people that do quote unquote prefer the taste of column distilled whiskeys, but that's only because they're not familiar with what pot still whiskey is supposed to taste like, right? It died out because... Of prohibition unfortunately anyways Jeff please keep the good questions coming brother that was a great one I really appreciate that one and really like that one so hey here's another brandy question <coughs> after I cough again because the pollen levels are extremely high today this is from Dale recently made some peach brandy but was unimpressed with the amount of peach flavor that came through after the spirit run I proofed the white spirit down to 112, then added four to five peach slices to each quart jar. This seemed to really fix the issue. How long should I leave the peaches in the jars? Do I need to refrigerate after putting fruit in the jars? Uh, great questions. A um, couple comments first. So I wouldn't have proofed it down to 112, I'd have left it at proof. With brandy in particular, you gotta be real careful when you're proofing it down. Take your time over a number of weeks to drop your proof or you'll get some saponification. You'll start to smell and taste soap, right? That's something that I'm big on. Take your time proofing your brandy down. Also, I would have left it at that higher proof so that the alcohol could have eaten some more of those volatile components of those peaches. But there's nothing wrong with what you did. Uh, so typically, whenever I'm going to do any peach slices in a quart jar like that, uh, I take the route of my good buddy Wayne over at Ozark Stillworks and I actually dry that fruit first and then make those into chips, basically real thin slices of the fruit, and then add that to the jar. It seems like the dried fruit works much better for capturing the quintessence of what that fruit is than what the wet fruit does if you're gonna post to still macerate. Now, the other way that you could have done this, there's a couple different ways. You could have dried some fruit down, thrown that into a gin basket and redistilled, or even have had that fruit in the gin basket as you were distilling the first time in order to capture more of that fruit flavor. You could have also done that with uh, wet or fresh fruit as well. Um, the other thing you could do is then take that peach brandy, uh, macerate it with wet fruit or dry fruit, whichever you prefer to do, uh, and then rerun that brandy through the still again and make a geist, right? Now, it's still a fruit brandy because the base was fruit, but now you're adding all those aromatic components uh, back into that brandy from that fresh fruit or that dried fruit in a redistillation. I actually just finished up doing one of these this past weekend. Uh, one of the orchards I normally stop at had uh, a single plum tree that was just loaded this year. 
but there was nowhere near enough plums to be able to actually do anything on any scale so i brought those plums home fermented them here and did did the damn thing here right um that's how i see home distilling at this point it's much more about um do the things that are special, right? And the things that you have and the farm distilling things. So I actually took that through a fermentation using the yeast that was on it. Uh, just barely bumped it with a capitalized, uh, with a little bit of sugar. Uh, I think less than maybe a half pound per gallon, something like that. Uh, but I wasn't happy with the flavor of it. It came off and yeah, it had a little aroma of plum. And I put a bunch of plums in there, by the way, guys. I mean, a ton of plums. Probably three to three and a half pounds per gallon, if I had to guess. And still didn't get what I wanted. It still wasn't up to my, my standards and my satisfaction. So I have a plan for that, though, in the future. Uh, anyways, I took all that double distilled uh, plum brandy and I set it aside and I macerated it with about two pounds per gallon of frozen blackberries. Uh, let it set for a week, redistilled it, put the blackberries that were in the uh, in the actual brandy itself into a gin basket on the still, redistilled it, and made a plum-based blackberry geist. And that blackberry geist turned out to be delicious. It's one of the best things I've ever made. I wish I could have done it on scale. If I could have done that on scale, I'd have been all about throwing that on some toasted French oak and selling the shit out of it in a few years. But um, life is what it is, right? You do the best you can with what you have and the circumstances that you were served. So guys, I hope I helped you out with your questions. Um, I know sometimes I get a little preachy when it comes to pot still and, and with brandy and stuff like that. I don't mean to, and I'm not trying to put down anybody else's methods. I just, I've done so much research on the traditional methods and I've done so much practical uh, distilling with those methods that it, it's hard for me not to get very passionate when I'm talking about those sort of things. And I, I hope you guys appreciate that and you understand that. Also, I wanted to make sure um, I haven't had a chance to call my buddy Bob in Costa Rica, and I need to give him a call sometime soon. He uh, he had a great idea for indexing the videos in the next book and all that stuff, and I said in the last video that I just, I unfortunately don't have time to do that, and it's still true that I don't. But Bob, I want you to know, man, you're never going to offend me with an idea. Ideas are awesome, dude. Um, you, it's never going to hurt my feelings in any way, shape, or form, and if I had time, I guarantee you I would do something like that for sure. Um, I just haven't had a chance to call you. It was easier to do in a video, but I'll give you a call sometime soon as soon as I quote unquote get caught up. Uh, I don't know when that happens, but you know, we just keep at it and keep open. All right, guys, I love you guys. Uh, thank you for all your support. Thank you for all your fantastic questions. If you guys need any clarification on these questions that you ask, if I, if I miss something, cause I'm a little tired, it was a long day today. Um, please let me know and I'll be glad to uh, expand and expound upon those things. Catch y'all later. Bye.